Good afternoon. Uh, how's everyone doing? Hope everyone enjoyed the keynote. Uh, looks like Amazon gave us some cool new toys to play with when we get home. Uh, my name is Mark Morgenstern. I'm a test engineering manager in our analytics group. My name is Devin Lazarus. I'm in the software engineering group with Sonos. OK, and we're here to talk about how Sonos leverages Kinesis. So uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about what is Sonos. Uh, hopefully you know already, but if you don't, I'll give you a little spiel about it. How many of you actually have Sonos? Anybody have Sonos? All right. Oh, good. good. You guys can good. stay. <laughs> um, and then we're going to talk uh, about our, the evolution of our data pipeline and where we're going. All right. So what is Sonos? Sonos is an amazing wireless smart speaker. And this puppy right here is our brand new speaker. It is amazing. It will literally blow your hair off. He had a full head of hair last week. <laughs> I only listen at 25% volume. That's why I got to keep mine. Um, so what we do is we want to produce excellent hardware and then use software to improve the, the experience well after it leaves the store shelf. Also, we uh, don't believe in the, the old saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. We are going to teach all of our old dogs new tricks. We just released something called TruePlay, or we will be releasing it later this year. And uh, this allows you to put your speaker wherever you like, and we'll do some auto magic tuning and get it to uh, sound great. So let's say you want to put it, uh, play one between your uh, microwave and your toaster. Go for it, man. We'll fix it for you. All righty. So Devin, did you say we have a plethora of data sources? We definitely have a plethora of data sources. Yes, we do. So at Sonos, we have a lot of different formats, a lot of different data, data sources. Um, you know, and we have a unique view across the music streaming ecosystem that uh, most people can't uh, really dive into. So, you know, we can look at uh, the big guys like Spotify or Pandora, or we could look at the regional or smaller offerings like RUSC or uh, Savin. Uh, we manufacture everything that Sonos makes, so everything in this picture over here is something that we designed and manufactured. We collect that data to help us improve the experience and to root out any problems. OK, so we do respect your privacy. The point of us collecting the data is so we can make the experience better. But we only do that. We only collect the usage data for people that opt in to provide us this data. The truth is that the data is actually more interesting to us in aggregate format anyway. However, if you guys allow us and you call our customer support team, we can definitely target and understand what's going on in your household. And it benefits you because we can solve your problem with minimal intrusion. OK, so let's uh, talk about our initial stab at a data pipeline. Um, our goal was to look into uh, usage patterns and get a better understanding of how our customers are using the system. We started off with some very basic, simple questions. You know, what are people listening to? What types of services? Is it online radio? Is it uh, on demand? Um, you know, is it their local music? Um, also, people's habits of listening to music change from hour to hour and region to region. And so the amount of data that flows into our system would change over the course of a day. So we needed to be able to handle the spikes without losing any data. Uh, finally, we didn't want any downstream processing to affect the ingestion of the data. So if we have a backup in the downstream process, we want to be able to queue up that data so we don't lose it. So this is our initial stab at a data pipeline. Um, it's built on EC2 and SQS. And um, I'll walk you through it. This laser pointer is not the greatest thing. Yeah, I can't see that at all. OK, so uh, the first thing, the data collector is a thin interface between our speakers and our data pipeline. Because the job of our speaker is to play music. And we needed to not overburden the system by adding a bunch of overhead to it. So the data collector serves as kind of our conduit into the data pipeline. 
Once the data collector gets the piece of data, it places it in our initial SQS queue. At this point, we now have a temporary storage of all of our data that's coming in. And what we do is we, the data collector will take a look at the payload and it'll split the data up into one of our three processing queues. During the processing queue layer, we basically look through the, the formats or we make it into the formats that we need to uh, display it properly in our consumption layer. Uh, initially, we had Splunk, Google Analytics, uh, some other proprietary stuff <laughs> that I can't talk about. Um, so this is our initial stab. It actually worked quite well. Um, you know, it got us a lot of great information that we didn't have before, and so, you know, we were proud of it. <laughs> so this is a heavily redacted uh, example of one of our dashboards. I assure you it's very cool, but I can't show you what it actually is. <laughs> uh, this is a slightly less redacted version of um, the health of our services. So it shows the internal load on uh, some of our Smappy services, which I also can't talk about. Smappy is a code name or an API name that we use internally that allows online music partners to integrate into Sonos. Sorry. <clears throat> okay, so challenges. Increased visibility of data throughout the company. Now, wait a second, that seems a little weird. How is that a challenge? Well, the problem is uh, all of this cool new data led to more complex questions by more important people. Uh, so we had aggregate data, but that doesn't really tell you the whole story. It just, you know, kind of gave us enough of a glimpse into the, uh, into the usage to actually make us want to know more about what our customers are doing. We needed to answer more complex questions, and the aggregate data just wasn't going to do it. Also, any time we wanted to add new data sources, that required development work for one or more teams. So that was not ideal either. Um, finally, uh, it, was, it became clear that although it was a great you know, initial stab at the pipeline with the uh, best available technology at the time, it wasn't going to keep up to our needs. You know, and planning out our data needs for the next 10 years became impossible. Um, so we basically went back to the drawing board and we said, let's design a more robust, secure, uh, awesome system. And my colleague Dave, Devin is going to tell you all about that. Right, so again, you know, the V1 pipeline uh, was, was very robust. You know, we'd have some issues um, in the system, but um, as Mark mentioned, we felt like we could improve upon the system. So let's see if I can do both. Um, so we have some design goals in, in the V2 pipeline. Um, we want to move away from aggregate reporting to event-based reporting. Um, having the speaker in the field uh, queue up um, some data and, and count that and then essentially provide that count to us was important. It gave us great insight but the counts aren't as interesting as the individual events when, again, you start to look at those in aggregate. Uh, again, we want to accept any kind of data. It didn't matter if it was binary, JSON, XML, uh, uh, and we didn't really want to develop for it. Um, every time we added a new data type that you saw in the beginning of those uh, two slides, we would have to develop, and that just took too much time to answer the questions for the business, especially in uh, development and prototyping phases of products. Um, we also wanted to spend more time securing the storage of the raw data. Uh, our system of record was becoming more and more important, so we wanted to lock that down uh, and take advantage of some more current uh, thinking around that area. And then, of course, we wanted to simplify and reduce the cost of the pipeline as well. So the bottom line, right, we needed to be able to handle orders of magnitude, more data, uh, by the end of this year with guaranteed delivery and storage and near linear scalability and under a sustainable cost model. And that's a lot, right? But that's really essentially what we're talking about. So I didn't change the title of the slide, but uh, this is the V1 pipeline. So again, we're going to go back and look at it. And our biggest problem, right, is that the actual data collector was doing all the work, right? So if we needed to expand capacity and to process the initial queue, we had to spin up a data collector that actually does all the work. Similarly, if we only really needed to increase the processing power uh, of the Splunk queue, for example, which was our biggest um, uh, t analytics tool at the time, again, we had to spin up a data collector to increase all the processing and not just target the, the Splunk queue. So that right there is, is a real problem from a cost perspective. 
We know the general strategy today. You'll hear it talked about in many different forms. We prefer to, to use the terms collect, store, process, and consume. This morning uh, in the keynote, I believe it was collect, store, analyze, and share. But it's basically the same idea. So uh, microservices, everything is discrete, uh, has a sole purpose, and it can be uh, uh, very specific to what it needs to do. So the collection layer, again, we, we're going to decouple. Uh, that's going to be a common theme throughout four, so I'm not going to say that too much more. But again, the collector here is supposed to optimize for raw throughput and scale. Um, again, the speaker's sole responsibility in the field is to play audio. We cannot interrupt your audio just to get data back to see how well or how poorly it's performing. Uh, at the time, uh, we were really looking into capturing some of the uh, benefits of streaming data. So we looked at Amazon versus Kafka, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And then once that decision was made, we were going to have to talk about the producer library versus rolling our own. And of course, we're interested in looking at Netty 4. We were on Netty 3 at the time. So to talk a little bit about Kinesis versus Kafka, which is a common question, right, and, and one that we addressed. Um, at the end of the day, they're actually very similar, as you can see some of the specs here. Um, one is more configurable, that being Kafka, because you're running it yourself. Um, but there are some benefits to Kinesis. Right away, replication is built in, first of all. And for Kafka, you can certainly set up uh, synchronization within NAZ, and within NAZ, and you can actually use something called acknowledgment so that when the replication occurs, there's an acknowledgment that I have it, boom, everything is in, in, uh, replicated the way I expect it. But when you start looking at going cross-region, it's very difficult and it's almost always a proprietary tool. I'm sure they'll fix that in the future. But at the end of the day, what it really came back uh, to, and this again was highlighted in the keynote, is that we're talking about an AWS managed service versus self-hosted and self-managed. And uh, Sonos is actually a very lean DevOps organization. so. Outsourcing that uh, responsibility to Amazon, which is not a business driver for us, was a great um, uh, business choice, I think. So when we redesigned the data collector, here we have, very simply, right, it's a thin client that listens to our speakers in the field and our other systems, takes that data and just shoves it into the Kinesis stream. And we're off and running. Now we're looking at the storage service. Again, we're trying to decouple it. Um, but, uh, you know, we wanted to increase the, the raw data, and then we want to look at the, some of the new uh, thinking around object stores. Obviously, you're looking at S3, Cassandra, HDFS, a lot of different solutions out there. We standardized on S3. Um, and so once that became uh, uh, our decision, we're then looking at the Kinesis consumer library versus, again, rolling our own consumer of the Kinesis stream to put it into S3. Um, when we decided to go to S3, we also wanted to capture some of uh, the, uh, the ideas behind a data lake. We actually call it a data zoo at Zonos because we do have some similarities with the main points of a data lake. But one thing that might be a little different is that we don't really care what the data is. They all go into the same file. We have special processing that allows us to abstract the data. So, you know, at the end of the day, it, it really does, it is up to the consumer to know what they're looking for. The storage service and the collection service have no knowledge of what they're actually doing. Storage just knows I'm just putting in S3. Collection says I'm just collecting the data. And it's up to the processors and the visuals, I, uh, sorry, the consumers to, to understand what they're looking for. So when we look at the Kinesis consumer library versus the rolling our own, at Sonos, we're definitely a, a build first, um, buy later company. Uh, even when you, uh, when you take a look at the, the speakers, um, almost everything we've written in there is written from the ground up. We do use open source, but as an example, the Wi-Fi drivers are, are very, Sonos, uh, very much a Sonos proprietary thing. So we looked at the benefit of writing our own, but the consumer library basically had everything built in. Lease and shard management, if we were to write that ourselves, we would have to do all that work. Payload aggregation, which is a way to get the most out of the Kinesis throughput, we would also have to self-implement that. So again, that stuff's not really uh, what is important to us or is a, is a business differentiator for us. It's the data itself that differentiates. So here's a little example of how we actually um, uh, do the storage service. It's actually called Rapono. That's uh, Latin for store. <laughs> so um, we just basically override uh, the iRecord processor. And for each uh, the process records method, for each record, we actually buffer the data in memory. Um, we use uh, uh, 
systems to optimize the, the input into S3. And then, of course, we check to see if we should be flushing that buffer based on some parameters. And then we emit the records to S3. And if that process is successful, then we checkpoint. And the reason why I'm bringing this up here is that this is how we handle uh, duplication or loss of data kind of in the same stream. If we try to emit these records and there's a failure of some sort, we just don't checkpoint. And that leaves the records back in the Kinesis queue and we can process them later. Now, there is a 24-hour window, so we better hope our storage service comes back before we um, start hitting that time period. So at the end of this process, we're now with a collection service and we now have a storage service. And we're halfway through our, our solution. So now we're looking at the processing stage. And again, we're decoupling here, but uh, most importantly, we're trying to improve our flexibility in the processing side and then the, uh, the analytics side, the consumption side. Um, we also wanted to take advantage of Spark. In-memory processing is the darling of the industry today, and it definitely works. Um, and at the same time, we wanted to support any consumer. Um, going back to the, the challenge of the V1 pipeline, anytime we wanted to add a new visualization engine, we would have to set up a new processing queue um, basically scale up the data collector and then uh, put that in place. And it just was too much uh, overhead to get, you know, like tomorrow we're going to go look at uh, QuickSight. It's going to take us five minutes connected to the pipeline now. Um, and so at the end of the day, we're now done with the processing. This one was actually easy. I didn't have to too much, do too much except say, here's your data store. Um, here's how you access the, the data lake. Now go to it. And so we have Spark running. We, of course, have MapReduce. And then we also have some proprietary um, jobs that ETL type stuff that, that we still use. So the last piece is the consumption layer. This is actually relatively easy from this, this uh, talk here. We're just decoupling. But most importantly, we're trying to allow for self-service. Uh, again, uh, kind of this was also highlighted in the keynote. The business people want to ask questions. And they want answers immediately. They don't really want to wait six hours, 20 hours, three weeks for an answer. Um, and so we, we want a system that allows them to, to access that data as quickly as they can. And so this is the end of our, this is our visualization side, right? We're still using Splunk. We're now using Redshift and other types of uh, data stores. We have different visualizations. Interana is a new product that we love. And of course, we have operational stuff running off this, this data stream now as well. And so at the end, the results of the V2 pipeline are that we primarily we have increased traceability throughout. So we know that when we accept the data, uh, a piece of data from the collector, we know that it ends up in the consumption stage. And we can track that all the way through now. We also have a self-service pipeline. While we have the main system of record operating off the Kinesis stream, we actually ran an experiment with the ops team and allowed the ops team to consume the Kinesis stream right then and there and develop some operational dashboards in real time around the use of music services in uh, the field. And then through our performance testing, we have basically, we haven't even found the limits, but uh, we have linear scalability now backed by EC2, uh, Kinesis, <coughs> and S3 at the collection and the storage layer. And overall, we've achieved a 20 times reduction in our costs. So one of the things I personally get most out of when I come to these conversations or these uh, conferences is understanding how companies actually solve some of these problems. The code is easy. You can kind of get a blog post or Stack Overflow is like my favorite website. Um, but understanding how people deal with some of the problems is, is more interesting to me. So, well, wait, Houston, we do have a problem, right? We have this V1 pipeline that is answering very critical questions in the business. It's also um, behind operational dashboards, right? So this data can't disappear. Um, but we have this brand new V2 pipeline that's just the cat's pajamas, and we want to get it out there. Um, so how do we do that? Well, shoot. Uh, we have to find a way to basically have V2 and V1 running in parallel. So how are we going to get V1 data to continue to flow through its pipeline while we're running V2 and verifying that all the data is, in fact, coming through correctly, being processed correctly, and is exactly identical to what you had before you had the new pipeline? And our solution here was a little ingenious. Uh, we did not do it. I found this little thing called the Log4j appender that's built for Kinesis. Okay? So in V1 data collector, we just refactored a little bit, added a little trace message, right? just sent the raw event into a, an appender that was configured to point to a Kinesis stream. 
and voila. We have both pipelines running at the same time so that we can verify that the visualization that's coming out of both is exactly identical. And we can make sure that when we transition to V2, that there is no difference, all right? For operational dashboards, that might be, eh, you might not necessarily need that. But when you're talking about finance, you're talking about money, it better be right, right? So uh, with this in place now, uh, we can actually go back, and if anybody really noticed, I only talked about the Kinesis versus Kafka. I never really approached the rest of the goal. And now we're able to do that, because now we have two pipelines running at the same time, and now we can focus on re uh, rewriting basically the data collection system. So we looked at the uh, Kinesis producer library versus rolling our own. They're both Java APIs, but again, same thing with the consumer library. We're getting async and put records by default, which is going to save on money. Uh, we would have to write that ourselves if we didn't. And again, we get payload aggregation, but um, they actually stole something out of our internal buffers, which I thought was pretty interesting. Not only do they, can you aggregate by records. So for example, we know we can fit 10 records in a one megabyte limit. Um, and so we're gonna throw that in with one put records request. Well, what happens if your payloads are like 247 bytes? You can actually gram all, cram all of those together in a payload as well so that you get a full one megabyte and it's not really driven by record boundaries, it's just bytes. So it's really interesting stuff. But the biggest piece of the producer library, which was at first scary to us, is that it's an actual microservice. It's a C++ microservice that runs inside your Java process. And your Java uh, process, our collection system, right, is just forwarding to that microservice through IPC. And then the microservice is actually doing the conversation to uh, Kinesis. But the code is out there. You can look at it. Uh, so we went, decided we were going to go ahead and try it and look into it. Um, we, this is a Netty4 channel handler. Uh, we're accepting a byte buffer, right? We've overridden the proper method, and that's it. This is exactly what we needed to do to actually talk to the Kinesis uh, system. You add the user record, tell it what stream name. We use GUIDs for partitioning. You don't have to use partitioning. Um, and then we just pass the buffer along. Now, there is some back pressure stuff, right? If Kinesis is, uh, is your scaling limit, uh, the producer library will actually throw some exceptions, so there is a way to actually handle that back off. You can you have a circuit breaker pattern if you wanted to kind of pause your system while Kinesis catches up. So that stuff's not shown here, but uh, you know that's a lot more than we could fit on the screen. So at the end of this, though, and this is work that we just finished, so at, at the end of finishing the V2 collection service, we now have increased our collection performance over 2,700% by moving to this system with Netty4 and the Kinesis producer library. And then the most important part to the business, right, is we have a huge decrease in cost per billion events. We went from over 4,000 to under 650 with V2. Now, the thing uh, that allowed us to get to this point, right, was running both pipelines at the same time. And so we were able to determine that running the, the pipelines at the same time would only cost us an additional 6%. And that's an insurance policy. That's actually cheap insurance policy to make sure that when we go to V2, there is no disruption to the business. And so that's kind of the end of V2. And at this point, I want to turn it back to Mark and talk about some future directions. All righty. So where do we go next? Well, thank you for your service, Sonos Data Pipeline V1. But you are no longer necessary. So we need to end of life that. And um, as Devin alluded to, and as some of you may know, Kinesis is not infallible. Uh, it can fail. And when it does, we need to have a backup plan. So currently, we log everything locally in the case of a Kinesis failure. However, we do want to go with the circuit breaker pattern. And if we detect failure in the Kinesis stream, we will reroute to a different stream in another region. All right, so to further on that, uh, you know, there was an event recently. And we were able to determine that we lost about 4% of our data. Um, we do have multi-region. We do have Route 53 with latency and health checks. Um, so we did see some the proper migration of, of data from one cluster to the one region to the other. But we still lost 4% during the, I think it was two and a half hours, roughly, that it was out. So we want to try and improve upon that. We, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't lose that. Um, as far as future for Data Collector, you know, we've been, uh, you hear Scala being talked about quite a bit. And we actually did a prototype with Scala and the Aka HTTP library. It was just a little too early for us to go to production. But then once we started writing a, with the producer library, 
why not just write in C++ and incorporate the producer library right into your system? So there's, we're, we're at the point now at Sonos where we actually are thinking about how we can get the most out of these instances in Amazon uh, for cost-wise, because we are at that get scale. And then, uh, you know, we run Spark in a cluster, uh, but to further the AWS uh, uh, advantage here, why not run Spark on EMR, right? Why do you have to run a master? Why do you have to think about Mesos versus Zookeeper or something else? Just let Amazon do all that and analyze your data and have fun with it. Okay, so a couple final takeaways here. Uh, separating of concerns allows each service to specialize. As he alluded to, now that we have good separation, we can scale up as necessary and, you know, reduce costs. Well, right, and then, you know, self-service analytics is unlocking the research potential of the entire company, right? We have salespeople, marketing people, manufacturing people, operations people, finance people, user experience people, customer support people. Everybody accessing this data now, and they're asking more and more questions, and we're starting to fit more and more uh, uh, answers in there. And now that we actually don't have to write any code to accept new data types, we actually have situations where developers are, uh, a bug will come in from the customer support team, and they have no idea what the heck's going on. A developer will write some code, push it out, and all of a sudden, we have this new data that shows up in the pipeline that allows us to understand what the heck is actually going on. So, and that's all done without interaction from us. We don't have to do that anymore. It just happens. And that's the most important part, really. Right. Um, so Amazon uh, Kinesis gives us all of the good streaming that we want without having to do all the DevOps overhead. Uh, yeah, and it's a great system. Yeah. All right, so that went faster than I thought yeah, it would. That to go a little fast. We have a lot of time for questions. <laughs> um, but most importantly, actually, you want to go to the next one? Is the next one on there? Yes, yeah. please. This is our first presentation. Please evaluate us. There's three simple questions, and I'm going to ask you for a favor. There's also a very small text input. One or two sentences. Help us get better, right? All right. Thanks a lot.